Uh, greetings, everyone. This is Stephen Roman, and this will be my sixth lecture on category theory. My website is www.sroman.com, and I'd be happy if you'd like to visit. Today I'm going to talk about universality. To begin, let's take a, another look at the comma category. So we start with a functor G from category D to category C and an object C in C. This is our anchor object. So we can have a picture here. Category C is here. Category D is here. Functor G goes in this direction. C is our anchor object. The objects in the comma category C arrow G are the ordered pairs of the form U little u mapping C to capital U. I'm sorry, G, capital G U. So for example, <clears throat> we have an object U over here. This is little u and this is G of capital U. A morphism, tau, mapping this pair, capital U, little u, from C to GU, to another pair, D, F from C to GD, is, so let me draw that in here, so here's F to GD, D is over here, is just a morphism tau, I should say comes from a morphism tau between these target objects from U to D for which when I complete this triangle, this will be G tau that this triangle commutes. So I need G tau composed with U is equal to F. Okay, so that's the uh, comma category, <coughs> its objects and its morphisms. What would it mean to say that an object u, little u, from c to g, u, is initial in this category. Well, that would mean that for all pairs d, f, from c to g, d, there exists a unique morphism tau mapping I'm just going to abbreviate this UU to DF okay so if you read the from the from the picture the pair capital U little u is u, is uh, initial if for any other pair D and F, there's a unique map here, tau, going from U to D that completes this triangle, it makes it a uh, commute. That property actually has another name. This is also called the universal mapping property.
and the pair u, the initial pair, is called a universal pair. U, capital U, is a universal object, and little u is the universal morphism or universal map. So to say it again, this pair has the universal mapping property for C and G if for any F from C to GD there's a unique tau from U to D that makes this triangle commute. So what we have seen is that the concept of a universal pair and the universal mapping property is equivalent to, is the, is the same as the concept of an initial object in this comma category CG. For each D in the category D, we can define a map. Tau CD. Let's look at the picture again. C is fixed, of course, it's an anchor object. Now I'm going to fix D for a minute. Then I then for every morphism from C to G D, there is a unique morphism from U to D, provided the, the pair is universal. Let's assume this is universal. So for each F, there's a unique tau. So that's, um, that gives us a mapping from HOM C G D, and this is in the category script C, to the HOM set U D, this is in the category script D. I'm going to denote this map by tau sub f because it certainly depends on f. So this map tau cd applied to f is tau sub f. The map tau sub f has a name. Some people call it the mediating morphism for F. Others don't give it a name at all, so not everybody uses that terminology, but I will use it. I think it's useful. Also, this map, which is often not explicitly mentioned, I will call the mediating morphism map. I am double indexing this C and D. Right now C and D are fixed, but later on we're going to uh, let leave C fixed and let D vary. And even later than that, we're going to let both C and D vary uh, when I talk about adjunctions, which will be in a subsequent lecture. But for now, let's let D vary and consider this family, which I, I might write a little more simply, just put a D there, the family of mediating morphism maps as D varies over the objects in the category script D. Well, <clears throat> the definition of the mediating morphism map or really the definition of tau sub f, says that it's the unique map that makes this true. And the uniqueness implies that tau cd of gh 
circle U is equal to H. This is for all H mapping U to D. Okay. Note also that this map U, the universal map, is given by tau C U inverse of the identity on U. So these are the properties of the mediating morphism map. This tells us that tau C D is bijective and tau CD inverse of H is equal to GH circle U. So I'll extend this here. Okay. So if we begin with the mediating morphism, family of mediating morphism maps, then we find that tau CD, the, these maps are bijective, and their inverse is given by this formula. Conversely, if we, if we begin with a family of bijections and we set u equal to tau cu inverse of 1u, And if tau inverse of CDH is given by GH circle U, then tau CD, this, well, let's say the individual map, will be the mediating morphism map. for the universal pair capital U little u c g d let's suppose we have a family of bijections so this is going to take hom c g d to hom u d and suppose these are bijections And, again, we set u sub c, little u sub c, equal to tau inverse c u, capital U, of 1 u. We know that this family is a family of mediating morphisms. for the appropriate universal pairs, if and only if their inverse is given by this formula. I think I'll use an alpha, because I've got other plans for H in a minute. G alpha circle U, C. Okay. And this is for all alpha mapping U to D. Well, let's suppose we have a map H mapping D to D prime. Then I can take the composition and apply tau CD inverse H circle alpha. And right away I've already made a mistake because uh, alpha maps U to D and H maps d to d prime, so this composition is mapping u to d prime, so I should have a prime here. This, according to this formula here, is g of h circle alpha composed with uc, which is gh circle g alpha composed with uc, which is gh composed with tau CD 
inverse of alpha. So uh, I will write this one down again. CD prime of H circle alpha. So this formula shows how to pull H out in front of tau inverse. But this is actually equivalent to this. So these two are equivalent. And I'll let you sort that part out. Now, since the tau CD maps are assumed to be bijections, as alpha varies over all maps, from U to D, F equals tau CD inverse of alpha varies over all maps from C to GD. So I'm going to replace alpha here by tau CD of F, and I'll have tau inverse CD prime of H composed with tau CD of F equals GH. And so when I put alpha equals tau CD of F, I have a tau CD inverse here, I'm just going to get alpha. Oops, sorry, F. Okay. And I'm going to move this one to the other side, swap left and right sides. And I can tweak this a little bit. Tau C D prime composed with G H apply first to F equals H apply first composed with C D. Actually, I'm sorry, I that applied after, applied to F. The back arrow is, a, is a follow by, apply after. And this is for all F mapping C to GD, so tau C D prime circle followed by GH is equal to followed by H circle tau CD on the HOM set CGD. Oops, sorry, that wasn't in the picture. Tau CD prime composed with followed by GH is equal to followed by H composed with tau CD. And this looks a lot like a naturalness condition where these are the natural maps, natural transformation, the components of a natural transformation. And these are the application of some functors to the morphism H. So I think that calls for a picture let me rewrite this formula on another page. On HOM CGD. So the picture will look like the following. From D to D prime, I have my map H. I need two functors, which we'll fill in in a minute. HOM 
CGD going to HOM CGD prime and HOM UD going to HOM UD prime. This is tau C D prime. I'm sorry, so tau there's no prime on this one, tau C D. This one is tau C D prime. So what goes here? If, if this expresses the fact that the square commutes, then this is going to be GH followed by, and this is going to be H followed by. So what are the functors? <clears throat> well, this one is just the HOM functor. HOM U dot. That takes an object D to the HOM set, HOM U D, and a morphism H to follow by H. And you need to follow by H in order to change the codomain from D to D prime. This one is quite similar. It's HOM of C comma G dot. And HOM C comma G dot is the composite functor. HOM C dot composed with G. First you apply G, and then you take the HOM functor. So what we have discovered is that the condition, this formula here at the top, says precisely that the family tau CD is a natural transformation from the HOM functor, HOM C G dot, to HOM U dot. And in fact, it's a natural isomorphism because the components are bijections. So we can add a third equivalent condition to the two we had before, and it all looks like the following. If tau CD is a family of bijections, and if U sub C equals tau inverse CU of 1u. So I, I didn't write down the domains and codomains, but tau CD maps HOM CGD to HOM UD. So U is given, C is given, G is given. So this is the setting. <clears throat> then we can say that the following are equivalent. One, that these maps, tau CD, are the mediating morphism maps, MMM, just going to abbreviate that, for the universal pairs U, little uc, from C to GD, two, that the tau CDs satisfy this formula U to D equals G H U to D circle U C and three that this family tau C D D is a natural isomorphism from the HOM set C G D I'm sorry, from the HOM functor, this is just dot to the HOM functor U dot. So, 
universality and the corresponding mediating morphism maps equivalent to naturalness of this family of bijections in the second component, D. <clears throat> this middle formula doesn't have a standard terminology, but I call it the inverse fusion formula for two reasons. One is I, I want to call it something so I can talk about it. But the term fusion formula does appear in some literature, not very often as far as I can tell, and it generally applies to a formula that <clears throat> is a little different from this one that gives a direct value of tau CD rather than an inverse value. <clears throat> and it is it comes from the duality. If you redo these arguments in the dual setting, you define co-universality and co-mediating morphisms. You will find the formula that is often called, well, sometimes called fusion formula, and I will call the direct fusion formula. And if we don't run too long on this lecture, I will describe that in more detail. Okay, so let's turn to some examples then of universality and I will give the universal pairs and let you think about the mediating morphism maps and the f and the inverse fusion formula and the naturalness. <clears throat> I think the simplest example comes when G maps set to set and is simply the identity functor. So the diagram then becomes very simple. Diagram for a universal pair. I actually don't even need to write anything on this side because G is just the identity, so I won't even bother with that. So pair, <clears throat> let me put it over here, U little u from c to u is universal if and only if for any set function for any set function f mapping c to d there exists a unique tau from u to d so that would go here, such that tau circle u equals f. Well, <clears throat> one thing we can observe immediately is that if f of x is different from f of y, then u of x must be different from u of y. And since for any pairs x and y, distinct values x and y, I can always come up with a set function mapping somewhere that will differentiate between x and y. U is going to have to differentiate between x and y always. And so that implies that U is injective. Moreover, if U failed to be surjective, then its image would not be all of capital U. That's the domain of tau. So I could, if I, if I could find one mediating morphism tau here, I can change its values outside of the image of U and get another different mediating morphism. So the uniqueness property implies that tau is also surjective and therefore uh, that u is surjective and therefore u is a bijection. 
and it's easy to see that if u is a bijection, then the universal mapping property will always hold. All I have to do is is uh, move u to the other side. So tau will be f circle u inverse. So what we have learned is that the universal pairs in this context are simply the pairs where u is any set and little u is a bijection. Let's do one that's a little more interesting. Free groups. So in this case, the functor will be the underlying set functor. Okay, this is the underlying set functor. So it takes a group G and just pretends it's a set, takes a group homomorphism and pretends it's a set map. So we'll let X be a non-empty set. What would it mean to say that a pair U little u from X to capital U is universal? Well, it's very similar actually to the previous example because this is a forgetful functor, an underlying set functor. It doesn't do anything except change your attitude about things. Your, it changes your attitude about groups to one of sets. So we don't really need to write the right-hand side of the picture down. Uh, we have, okay, in this case, we have our anchor x and u here to u. Now, u is a group, but we're thinking of it now as a set rather than writing gu, which I maybe I should be doing. So this pair will be universal if for any set function from x to the group d, to a group d, there exists a unique group homomorphism, this is also a group, that makes this diagram commute, tau circle u equals f. Okay, so far it looks very much like the previous example. Now suppose uh, for a minute that x is actually a subset of u and that u is j is the injection map. What would this be what would this be saying in that case? Well, it would be saying that I'll write it down again for any set function from x to d a group there exists a unique extension f bar from u to d. So f bar agrees with f on x, but f bar is now a group homomorphism. Okay. So any set function from x into a group can be extended to a group homomorphism on the full set or the full group U. I'm going to call this the, and extended uniquely, I'm going to call this the unique extension property for little u mapping x to u. Or for the pair if you want, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So universal pair is a pair that has this unique extension property. Universal pair of this form, where x is actually a subset of u, and 
the universal map is injection. Okay. Well, <clears throat> in some treatments of group theory, I think the more advanced treatments generally, or at least the more categorical treatments, this is actually the definition of a free group on X. The free group F sub X on X is defined to be any group that has, for which, the, uh, and so this pair would look like this, J, X, F, X. The free group is defined to be any group for which this pair is universal or has the unique extension property. In less categorical treatments of group theory, free groups are usually defined by first, uh, let's say the set X consists of elements XI, I, and some index set. Then you define X inverse to be the set of all formal inverses of these elements, and A to be the alphabet X union X inverse, and then your free group is the set of words over this alphabet under juxtaposition. And the identity is the empty word, and I won't go into details on this, but when this, def when this is the definition of free group, one often sees as the next order of business a proof that the free group has the unique extension property. Okay. So either way it's approached comes out the same. The free, the free group is characterized by the fact that it has the unique extension property. We can do something very similar in the context of vector spaces. So let's uh, consider a vector space V with basis B. You could think of this as, uh, as, as V as the free vector space over B, although nobody does. Uh, you don't hear that said, but what you will hear said is that any linear map, any linear transformation F from the vector space V to another vector space is uniquely determined or defined, if you want, by its value on the basis vectors in B. And those values can be assigned arbitrarily. So I won't write all that out. Well, that's exactly the universal mapping property. Okay. That any set function which is how you specify the values of your linear map on the basis vectors, any set function can be uniquely extended to a linear map from V to W. Okay? So, <clears throat> vector spaces are universal objects as well. There, and and uh, the bases form the anchor for the uh, universal pair. Okay, how about fields of quotients? Of an integral domain. Okay. So let's define a functor from the category of fields 
to the category of integral domains to be the forgetful functor. Oops, if you will. So that means that um, we are thinking of a field as an integral domain by ignoring the fact that the non-zero elements have units. And we'll let R prime denote the field of quotients of an integral domain R. Then the pair R prime with injection, an inclusion map, is universal for anchor R forgetful functor G because it has the universal mapping property. Any embedding, the, uh, the um, in integral domain, the uh, morphisms are the ring embeddings, the monomorphisms. And any monomorphism from R to S can be raised or extended uniquely to a map from R prime, an, an embedding from R prime to S. Okay, so these are uni these are universal also. Okay, here's another little bit more complicated example, quotient spaces. So let's let C be the category whose objects have the form ordered pairs M, A. M is an R module, so I'm going to fix a ring, and A is a submodule. of M. So the, the base ring is fixed. This uh, I'll call the category of modules with distinguished submodules. Modules with distinguished submodules. What is a morphism? F from pair MA to a pair NB. Well, this is just a linear map from M to N with the property that F maps A into B. So it takes the distinguished submodule A into the distinguished submodule B. I'll leave it to you to check that this makes sense. You, you have to check composition and make sure that this condition uh, is satisfied in the composition and it's uh, just a one-liner. Okay. So let's draw a picture and we need a functor G. So let's G is going to take modules, the R modules, into this category C, and G of M is going to be the ordered pair M, and the distinguished submodule will be the trivial submodule. And a map from M to N will be taken to essentially the same map M0 to N0 when the distinguished submodules are trivial then this condition is always satisfied because 0 always goes to 0 so we aren't really uh, saying anything new here let's have a picture
There's our functor G. K is a submodule of M. I'm looking at this pair M mod K zero pi mapping M mod K two M I'm sorry, M comma K to M mod K zero. And I'd like to show this as universal. So what I need to show is that for any morphism going to N0, so this over here is just N, there exists a unique mediating morphism that completes this picture here. So I, I could just again write tau f here. It's g tau f, but well, so I'll put g. The g is just for getting things. <clears throat> so this will be g tau f circle pi equals f. Now f circle pi equals f. Okay. Well, what is this? This uh, oh, I did. I guess I should have said this. This is the canonical projection. Okay. That makes sense because when you take the canonical projection mod k, k goes to zero. So this will hold if and only if tau f applied to pi of little m, so that's going to be um, little mk, the coset little mk, is equal to f of m for all m in capital M. So that's an if and only if. Well, this could serve simply as the definition of tau sub f, provided it is well defined. So what we have to check is that <clears throat> if mk is equal to nk, then that means m minus n is contained in k, which means that f of m minus n is equal to zero, because remember that f here maps this pair to this pair, so it has to send everything in k to zero. And so that is fm equals fn. And that makes this well defined, because you can change coset representatives and you'll still get the same value. So this is, in fact, a universal pair. And without all the hoopla and stuff, it really just amounts to the quotient module. M mod K is the universal object. One last example. Tensor products. So let's let u cross v be the Cartesian product of two vector spaces over the same field, little k, let's say. Okay. And let's let the category vect plus have as objects the vector spaces over k with their linear maps and one additional object. So include U Cartesian product with V. Now I have to say what the morphisms are. The morphisms from U cross V into some vector space W, these are the bilinear maps. 
from W into U cross V there are no maps and from U cross V to U cross V it's just the identity. I have to have the identity and that's all I want. And now let's look at the pair U tensor V with the tensor map which sends U cross V to U tensor V and T of U V equals U, little U tensor little V. Okay. This is universal. for u cross v g. What does that mean? It means that for any map from u cross v into w, in other words any bilinear map, there is a unique extension of f to the tensor product. So I guess I should have drawn it this way. There's a unique linear map. This one's linear now. Taking U cross V, uh, U tensor V into W. <clears throat> One can say that the purpose of the tensor product is to turn bilinear maps into linear maps. That's exactly what is the universal mapping property. Okay, so we have seen that free groups, vector spaces, fields of quotients, quotient modules, and tensor products are all universal objects. Okay. And that's about all um, I have time for in terms of examples. <clears throat> One thing I do want to mention before we finish is that if we have, uh, let's say, um, G is a functor from D to C, and we have an anchor object in C, and suppose that we have a universal pair, so script S, S, U from C to GS. Then another pair, script T, T, V, C to GT, is universal if and only if there exists an isomorphism alpha between the anchor objects for which Uh, G alpha composed with U is equal to V. So the universal maps are connected this way. I'm not going to prove this. It's in my book. You might want to prove it yourself. Okay. So if you have a universal pair, essentially anything isomorphic to that will be a universal pair, and nothing else will be. Okay, I think this lecture's run uh, long enough. Uh, <clears throat> in my book, there's a little bit more on this chapter on universality because I, I talk about co-universality, which dualizes all these concepts by essentially reversing the arrows. But I also interchange the roles of C and D, the two categories, um, because <clears throat> I want to connect universality and co-universality in the opposite direction. So I've got functors going in both directions. So this is category C, category D. We've been talking about this functor. And for co-universal maps, uh, or co-universal pairs, we'll talk about functor going in the other direction. And this will lead in a straightforward way to the notion of adjoints and adjunctions. So thanks again for watching. 
uh, please leave a comment if you have the time. I appreciate those comments, and uh, they're helpful to me. And thanks again.